morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Nicolene Lottering, and today's online lecture production will focus on the clinical anatomy of back pain. This lecture will be subdivided into four sub-videos, which are segregated for the learning objectives. So the learning objectives for this lecture are pretty straightforward. The first subsection will provide general epidemiological information on back pain with a focus on common pain generators and diagnoses in adults. Specifically for lumbar pain, I will present main anatomical and mechanical features consistent with major diagnoses while discussing the approach to physical examination. Please note that this is only a general overview and more will be covered in significant detail in your CBL and your clinical lectures. The second video then will provide a review of the anatomy of the spine, which is all encompassing of the osteology, arthrology and accompanying structures such as ligaments. You should also become familiar with the anatomical structures that can be pain generators, such as muscles, fascia and joints and nerves. Accordingly, deep and superficial muscle groups will be covered in a separate video, along with their movement and range of motion. Finally, I'll provide an overview of the imaging approach to the spine by focusing on X-rays, DEXA and MRI for the identification of normal anatomy, as well as the presentation of degenerative pathology, disc herniation and fractures, to name a few. So two large surveys of adults enrolled in general medical care or health insurance plans in Canada and the UK reported back pain lasting at least one week during the preceding month in almost one in four adults and back pain within the previous six months in almost three in four adults. In addition, three in every four individuals with back pain also report having pain in other body regions in order of frequency, the knee, shoulder and neck, which makes utilization of the pain pain drawing particularly beneficial to fully understanding pain symptoms in these patients. So lower back pain is the most common chronic pain affecting almost 60% of adults at some point during their lives. Back pain may be caused by a variety of conditions, most commonly related to musculoskeletal or neurological abnormalities, as demonstrated in the table beside. Other medical conditions, including vascular, gastrointestinal and gynecological pathology, may also result in visceral pain. Therefore, the physical examination must include a general medical screening, as well as abdominal and gynecological evaluations. So based on the results of the aforementioned survey, if we break down the diagnoses of back pain for patients seen by their GP, the majority, so between 75 and 90%, exhibit non-specific back pain, which is typically traumatic or mechanical in nature, so for example due to lumbar strains or postural strains. If we then consider the pathoanatomical causes, 3% are due to herniated discs, which are most common in individuals in their 20s due to the fact that the nucleus pulposus is highly hydrated. And then as we increase with age, eventually this loses water content and dehydrates. Therefore, the likelihood of, de of disc herniation decreases with age. Almost 10% of back pain is also associated with degenerative pathologies of the spine. So low back pain may occur in isolation or in conjunction with lower extremity pain. Associated lower extremity pain may suggest a neurological pain such as radiculopathy. Signs and symptoms help differentiate among common causes of back pain as demonstrated in the table. Neurological symptoms or deficits suggest the need for additional evaluations. Therefore, the physical examination should include an evaluation of the range of motion, neurological signs of strength, reflexes and sensation, and hence why a solid anatomical knowledge is required. The examination should be divided into musculoskeletal and neurological examination. So more specifically, when we're looking at the MSK evaluation, we're looking for muscle palpation for tenderness, spasm or trigger points. When assessing the skeletal assessment for posture, range of motion, both active and passive, the neurological examination can then be subdivided into strength testing, reflexes, sensory examination of touch and pin through dermatome testing, as well as gait testing, which will assess casual movement and strengths. So if we think about the common anatomical elements that are considered to be the common causes 
of pain of the lower back. So noting that if degenerative or broken, they may not actually cause or manifest as pain. So there are three main elements, the first being soft tissue pain generators. So this is going to be muscle, fascia or ligaments, which are considered to be the most common pain generators. So if we look at young people, if you've been engaged in some activity, so for example, gardening, where you're constantly flexing and extending the back, you can get muscle pain due to the repeated bending. If you play sports or, or have slipped or strained a muscle, for the most part, these muscle problems do fix as they have a relatively good blood supply. Fascia is innervated by pain fibers, so fascia and muscle problems go hand in hand. And a bit further down the list to be affected will be the ligaments. So ligaments are involved in maintaining the stability of the spine. So for the most part, the spine is stabilized by the movement of muscles, so when we're referring to posture. However, in severe cases, sometimes the muscles don't contract as quickly or quickly enough to maintain the alignment of the spine. Then all of the strain is left to the ligaments. So this will in turn result in postural problems. It's important to note that ligamentous problems take a lot longer to fix compared to muscles due to blood supply. So a second generator is going to be the joints. So we're talking about synovial joints, which are going to be your facet or zygap physio joints of the spine. These can become arthritic and generally are going to be quite movable except for the sacroiliac joints. We then have our intervertebral discs, which are considered to be secondary cartilaginous joints. So if these start to degenerate, it can be a source of pain. And actually, if it's going to de degenerate um, or prolapse, it's usually going to be in people in their early 20s, as they have a decent center or nucleus pulposus for the disc. And when you get older, the disc eventually starts dehydrating, it becomes shorter, decreases in height and it's going to lose fluid. So it's less likely to prolapse as we increase with age and it's very rare in older individuals. We typically see this in young or fit adults. And then the third common pain generator are going to be the nerves. So we're referring to our spinal nerves, which exit from the intervertebral foramina. Um, and these contain both motor and sensory fibers. So patients will often complain of pain if sensory fibers or the pain fibers are irritated due to inflammation or compression or both around the spinal nerve. So here we're talking about the dorsal rami of the spinal nerve, which is different to the roots or rootlets, which are the fine tangles that lead directly into the spinal cord. So the rami are distal to the dorsal root ganglia, and we have two divisions of the spinal nerve, so the dorsal versus ventral ramus. We also have the current meningeal nerves, which are going to innervate structures within the vertebral column that can be pain generators. And as previously mentioned, if nerve fibers are exposed to inflammation due to disc prolapse, for instance, and there is an inflammatory response, or if we have a tearing of a ligament per se, this can then excite the pain fibers um, and the nerve fibers can then be stimulated by compression. So if you notice, if you knock your funny bone, then the mechanism stimuli of the nerve can result in paresthesia, tingling, um, or pain on the medial aspect of the forearm as well as the little finger. And this is due to inflammation or compression of the ulnar nerve, as an example. Less common causes are fractures to bones, so you can suffer a blow to the spine in a healthy adult, or you can have fractures in someone who is osteoporotic. So women tend to hit that osteoporotic range a lot quicker or earlier than men due to menopause, and the lack of estrogen then results in a decrease or loss in bone mass. So women are more at risk to osteoporotic fractures, which are also going to affect the spine as this bears a lot of compressive force. Infections are going to be relatively a rare cause of back pain. Metastases from primary tumors seated in the spine. So for example, if we consider breast cancer or prostate cancer, prostate cancer, it has the potential to spread to the spine due to an unusual set of veins that surround the prostate and then enter the vertebral column and go all the way up to the skull. And then lastly, referred visceral pain. So for instance, pain or abnormalities of the uterus may manifest as lower back pain. So if we think about pain itself, 
We have this demonstrated in three different colors. So we have somatic pain, radiating, and then visceral referred. So somatic pain, most back pain is consistent with somatic pain. So deep somatic pain is initiated by the simulation of um, nociceptors in ligaments, tendons, bones, blood vessels, fascia and muscles, and this presents as a dull, aching, poorly localized pain. Examples will include sprains as well as broken bones. The second type is radiating pain, and this is most often described as a deep and searing pain. So radicular pain follows the path of the nerve into the arm or leg, for example, and may be accompanied by numbness and weakness. So this type of pain is caused by compression, inflammation, and or injury to a spinal nerve root, as we discussed before. Um, other terms for radicular pain are sciatica, for instance. And this can be caused by conditions such as a herniated disc or spinal stenosis. The last type of pain is then visceral pain. So visceral structures are highly sensitive to stretch, ischemia, and inflammation. But they're relatively insensitive to other stimuli that normally evoke pain in other structures, so such as burning or cutting, for instance. Visceral pain is diffuse, it is difficult to locate, and is often referred to a distal, usually superficial structure, such as the muscles of the back. So then referred pain occurs when the pain is located away or adjacent from the organ that is directly involved. So an example of this would be inflammation of the kidneys, in turn causing lower back pain as per the distribution map on screen.